500 years ago, England was emerging into a new era. After years of war, plague and famine, the kingdom was enjoying peace and prosperity under the reign of the first Tudor king, Henry VII. A new class of business-savvy farmer was thriving, boosting food production. And then over she goes. While wool from their sheep was generating half the nation's wealth. Many of the nation's farms were under the control of the biggest landowner in England after the king, the monasteries. Their influence could be felt in every aspect of daily life. They were not just places of religion, they were at the forefront of technology, education and farming. But with the daily lives of monks devoted to prayer, they depended increasingly on tenant farmers who worked and tended their lands. Steady, girl. <laughs> now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to Tudor England, here at Wealdon Downland in West Sussex, to work as ordinary farmers under the watchful eye of a monastic landlord. Here we That's the way. Nice. To succeed, they'll have to master long-lost farming methods. Those flanks are going again. And get to grips with Tudor technology. <laughs> Quite nice. It's a really violent process. While immersing themselves in the beliefs, Amen. customs, oh. and rituals that shaped the age. This is Merry England for heaven's sake, so to speak. Let's enjoy it. <laughs> this is the untold story of the monastic farms of Tudor England. In the early 1500s, no help for the poor was available from the state. Those in need relied solely on the charity and hospitality of others. Hospitality was a vital social virtue, the measure by which any good Christian would be judged. And at the heart of this culture of hospitality and giving were the monasteries. Beyond their gates, they ran almshouses, and within the monastery, they accommodated everyone from the destitute traveler to the wealthiest noble. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. 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 James, can I interest you in some pottage? Well, I'm sure it's good for the soul. <laughs> Monastic expert, Professor James Clark, is joining the team for a meal. Did the monasteries do much entertaining or hospitality? Absolutely, it's really central to the monastery's service to society. The charity, that is, in the strict sense, loving kindness to your, your fellow man, is really at the heart of the monastic vocation. At the lower end, it would be akin to a kind of backpacker's hostel. But at the other end of the scale, for the most distinguished guests, there would be really lavish accommodation and uh, food would be laid on. For the monks, hosting an esteemed guest wasn't just hospitable, it was profitable. Entertaining nobility was an excellent way to encourage large donations to the monastery. The nobles believed that supporting the monastery would guarantee that they went straight to heaven when they died. The abbot is planning a feast for a wealthy patron, and James is enlisting the team's help to prepare for the visit. Well, I have some particular tasks in mind for you. Uh, there's <laughs> going to be a lot of preparing of bed linen, so that does mean laundry. <laughs> no lucky, escaping lucky the laundry. Me. And there could well be a uh, need for some assistance in the kitchen, um, because uh, lavish meals are expected, um, nice as pottage is. <laughs> as well as monks and workers, the monastery also accommodated other members of society on a permanent basis. 
Part of the monastery's remit was to provide care for some of the elderly, their retired staff, or their most generous donors. James is enlisting the team to renovate a room in the outer precinct of the monastery as part of something known as a corridy. A corridy is a grant which is really like a kind of pension. It provides an individual with accommodation and food over the course of a year, and the monastery might grant that to one of their long-serving um, lay servants. And after 20 or 30 years' service, instead of a gold watch, um, they're granted this corridy, which is really going to give them uh, room and board to live out their, their days in their, their mm. twilight years. So it's going to need a bit of renovation, really. I mean, this floor's in quite yes, a state now. Yes, this floor is, is um, looking past its best. It's worth remembering, of course, that they expect something of high quality. This is a valuable um, retirement home. I'll have a chat with the boys, especially about the floor, see what we can do. Before the boys set to work on renovations, they must attend to an urgent matter on the farm, the pea crop. Well, if we look closely, we've still got a crop. That is fantastic. Oh, yes, please. That is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> the taste. Good. Taste of summer. Peas were important in Tudor England as both food and animal fodder. Unlike garden peas, field peas were left to dry on the plant until they were harvested. It made them easier to store, but also vulnerable to birds. This is the thing. If we start drying this crop out here, all the birds are going to be looking at it and going, they've laid on a pea buffet. Let's get in there. Yeah, it's going to be a proper feast. Bird control was a serious business. In the later Tudor period, bounty payments of a penny for three birds' heads were offered. And farmers often employed children to frighten away the pigeons and rooks. Tom and I are erecting a bird scare. We're putting in hazel poles. We're going to tie some string between them. And onto that string, we're going to hang some shells. Tudor-style wind chimes. So this is be this gentle. Yes. That was work, that was. So we're taking advantage of the wind, making sure all the shells just bounce off of each other, making some noise. That's the thing, being a Tudor farmer, or being any farmer, you can't afford to lose a crop, but especially in Tudor times, these peas were your sustenance. Right, I'm going to stick another stake in, Tom. Am I going to get in trouble if I walk across the pea crop? If you don't walk, the birds will eat. I'll be delicate. Ruth has begun preparations for the abbot's feast, starting by making butter for the table. Now, the reason I've transferred my milk into these dishes is to help the cream separate. Anybody who's a little bit older remembers the days before homogenised milk, and they remember that in milk bottles, it always used to rise, and you always used to get a bit of cream on the very top. That's what's happening here. Each day, a new bowl of milk was settled. And Ruth is starting to process yesterday's batch. Look, see how thick that cream is. Super thick, look at that. Not only was butter an important source of calories, it was also considered good for the health and a cure for chest complaints. Led on to minimise splashing. Hear that? Knowing what stage you're at is all about listening to the sounds that it makes in the churn. And now, it's all a matter of time. A volume of cream like this can turn into butter in as little as 15 to 20 minutes. Butter, along with other dairy produce, was known as a white meat, most commonly consumed by poorer members of society. After all, everyone had a cow. The point was you could graze a cow even if you had no land yourself. You could graze it on the common land. You had a right to put a cow on the common, which meant that you had access to some milk, 
You could make your own butter, you could make your own cream, you could make your own cheese. White meats, therefore, were a very democratic food. Everybody had them. And the rich sneered. But dairy produce wasn't the preserve of the poor for long. By 1500, landowners were taking back farmland and also common land to establish parks for hunting. It meant peasants could no longer graze their animals for free. Now you've got to actually rent a field to keep your cow on. And that meant that increasingly, from 1500 onwards, cows and cow's milk became something associated with the wealthier sort of peasant. It all feels a little bit stiffer, so I'm really listening now. really predict whether it's seconds away or another five minutes. We mu Did you hear? Suddenly it sounds wetter. That noise has changed, doesn't it? Oh, yes, look at that. Now, that looks good. There we are, look, butter. The final stage is to squeeze all the butter particles into a solid lump. Now, obviously, doing this with your hands, there's a problem. The warmth of your hands starts to melt the butter. So, instead, one uses a pair of wooden hands. Once the buttermilk is removed, Ruth adds salt, which is a preservative. And indeed, if I put enough salt in it, I can even make a product that can survive for a full year in an edible, not necessarily a tasty, but in an edible fashion. Well, what kind of trouble do you think Ruth has got us into now? Oh, you never know with Ruth, do you? Oh, dear. Peter and Tom are keen to get on with their monastic restoration project. And the priority is laying a new floor. It'll be made from a mixture of lime putty and ash, known as lime ash, which was strong, flexible and a good heat insulator. The boys have come to collect some limestone from the forest to produce their own lime putty. This is the key ingredient to our floor. It's chalk, we're gonna heat it up. That's gonna dry off the carbon dioxide. We're gonna put that in water. That'll turn it into a putty. Then we're gonna lay it in our floor. And as it dries out and reabsorbs carbon dioxide, it's gonna turn back into chalk, back into a stone and make our floor absolutely solid. To turn the limestone into the lime and ash mixture needed for the floor, it must be roasted at a temperature of over 900 degrees Celsius. Just need to make sure that every piece of that chalk hits that magic number of 900 degrees. Chalk, or limestone, was hugely popular as a building material in the Tudor era. While the Anglo-Saxons had built with wood, the Tudors needed lime to make mortar for their stone-built castles, city walls and churches. Lime ash was normally gathered from the bottom of kilns where limestone was burnt. Lime kilns really take off in the Tudor period, and that's the reason why in 1500 there's a massive surge in the fashion for lime ash floors. However, farmers like us, who might not be too close to a lime kiln, could make their own, such as this. It's a real crossover in technology. In Tudor England, the shadow of plague and disease was ever-present. People worked hard to keep a clean living environment. There were even systems for waste removal. Centuries before germs were discovered, 
Cleaning was a surprisingly rigorous affair, especially in the dairy. With the butter made, Ruth needs to wash her equipment. A Tudor housewife had three lines of defence in her battle for hygiene in the dairy, and not one of them included soap. First and foremost came salt. Used with a damp cloth, it helps to scrub, but it also, of course, kills bacteria. She then turned to the second line of defence, boiling water. All the dairy utensils were finished off by being scalded over all of their surfaces. And her last line of defence was sunlight. More specifically, the UV element of sunlight. She might not have known why it worked, but she knew that it did. In fact, the UV kills bacteria. So on a nice day like today, you'd have seen a very common sight outside any woman's dairy. All her dairy utensils lined up in the sun, getting a good sterilising dose of sunlight. The limestone has been roasting for three hours, driving off carbon dioxide and leaving a highly volatile product called quicklime. It's then put in water for a process known as slaking. So if we just pop that in. There it goes, look at it. Look, oh, look at amazing. that. It appears to have worked. If I bring that back up, there we go, look at that. Oh, that's the dangerous bit. So that is, that is lime slaking, and it's turning into a putty. The fire drives off all the carbon dioxide, and it makes uh, the chalk very, very volatile. When it goes in the water, uh, the water is absorbed, and there's an exothermic reaction. So this isn't the heat from the fire that's doing this. This is the chemical reaction that's heating up this water, and you can hear it, and it's slowly turning into a putty. Look at that. That is lime putty on my shovel. The lime will continue to slake in the water overnight. In 1500, the shape of England's waterways and wetlands was unrecognisable from today. Before the extensive land drainage of the later 16th century, these regions provided a wealth of resources, from fish and wildfowl to peat used for fuel, and something without which no Tudor home would have been complete, rushes. Hi, Linda. Oh, hi, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth has come to meet rush worker Linda Lemieux. The rushes they harvest will be made into floor mats for the room the team are renovating. Rushes are a rather ignored resource in modern Britain, aren't they? Yeah. You look at the domestic interiors of the late 15th and early 16th century, and you can spot rushes here, there and everywhere. In Tudor England, they used them for their mattresses, their chair seats, their cushions. Their flooring. the flooring. <laughs> Hats. Yep. Baskets. Yeah. Rushes were commonly cut between May and September, as near to midsummer as possible. Because it's a harvest, we've got to do it in a certain four or five weeks of the year. That's all we've got. All oh, right. So, th these will all die down. If you come to the river in, in October, you won't see a thing. Right. And you come to the river in April, you won't see a thing. So they all die down right back into their rhizome in the mud. Before Ruth finishes harvesting the rushes, she'll need a decent floor to put them on. Peter and Tom are combining their lime ash putty with sand, clay and flint to give the mixture strength. This is really good, our lime putty mixed with the ash. 
The boys are adding a special ingredient to bind their floor. Whoa. Curdled milk. That smell you or the milk? Ah, it's a little bit of both, Tom. I mean, that should go as the floor ages, so we don't have to worry about it too much. Used in concretes like this since Roman times, sour milk contains a protein called casein, which bonds with the lime to make it durable and waterproof. We're like tiny little bakers making a giant cake, aren't we? Once all the ingredients are combined, they can start to lay the floor. If we just get it in there and stamp it down, and then flatten it off later with spades. Feeling good. Feeling good. It's getting there. I'm glad they're not too heavy. <laughs> yeah, no, good harvest we got here. <laughs> now it's cutting. Good boy. good boy. Before the rushes can be used, they must be dried out. We, if we use them straight, they're so brittle, look, they'll just snap straight away like that. Oh, yeah. So what, what you have to do is let the cell structure dry out. So here's a couple that I cut about five weeks ago. And now they don't snap. And if I try and just tear that, I can't. To make the floor mats, the rushes must be plaited together. I'll hold it for you. Just go okay. over. Under. That's right. Uh, I like the feel that's developing there. Yeah. That's, that's tough, isn't it? That's strong, but it's still got a certain soft and bounciness to it. Now, if you imagine your mattress might need about 100 feet of this plat. <laughs> <laughs> Should we do a kid's one? <laughs> Hygiene dictated that the floor mats be replaced every year. So there was scarcely a time when plaiting rushes wasn't on the to-do list. It's the final push to finish the renovations. The boys are polishing the floor with milk to give it a hard, waterproof coating. This is going to be, this is going to be a fantastic floor. I can feel it. And Ruth has almost completed the sleeping mats. I've made loads of the plaits. I should probably have to make some more, but still. And then I'm sewing them together into a mat. This floor looks so much better. That's not bad, is I it? I think you made a really good job. Oh, thank you. Right, where do you want your mats? Oh, yeah, stick them out of the way for a minute, because I've got to get the hygiene to sort out first. OK. I've got a whole load of herbs to scatter on the floor. And they serve two basic functions. The first thing is about smell. People in this period believed that disease was carried by evil miasmas, by bad smells in the air. And if you breathed that evil miasma, you would get sick. So wherever you lived, wherever you were spending time, you wanted it to smell as sweet and clean as possible. But then there's also a role for insecticides. Things like my tansy and my wormwood, flea bane, they're for keeping insects out of the house. Things like flies or ants or, or body lice, fleas, anything like that can be driven out. And it will make the whole living experience not only healthier, but much pleasanter. Do you want to stick these mats down then? I've got a little lay down. Yeah. In addition to the room and a provision of food, the corridor might include firewood and some cooking equipment. Is that the last one? Yeah. I think the floor makes a huge difference. You know, this is easy to keep clean, to look after, to be comfy, isn't it? Mm. Home sweet home. Yeah. The influence of the church on the people of Tudor England extended far beyond its role as landlord and welfare provider. They also controlled the spread of ideas. Major centres of learning with extensive libraries, the monasteries were the custodians of knowledge. 
Monasteries commissioned deluxe books, costly and prestigious objects, as gifts for their most distinguished patrons. And Tom will be making one to present at the abbot's feast. Historically, books had been written on vellum, a material made from calfskin. But by 1500, another medium had taken over, paper. Expert Jim Patterson is showing Tom how paper was produced. What we've got in here is a mixture of linen uh, and water. They're the ingredients for Tudor paper making. You would start off with, with waste rag, it would be a recycling process, and that's the pulp that would result. So there's no wood involved at all? None whatsoever, not till much, much later in history. Uh, now you're going to form a sheet on a hand mould. OK. There we are, by dipping it in below the surface, go in oh, like that. that that's way. it, that's it. Okay. In you go, below the surface, flood the, the mould and bring it up. Clear of the, bring it clear of the, the vat. Up, now shake it, forward and yeah. back, side forward to side. And back. Can you see? Right. Side to side, forward and back. And you'll see the sheet actually forming. And it's leaving the fibre on the surface. A little bit uneven. <laughs> Should I, I go again? No, I think that'll pass for Tudor paper. I think <laughs> and the next stage is couching from the French couche de lay. Just placing that on there. That's right. Bring it up right. This was the job for the assistant. This was the non-technical. <laughs> non-technical. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I'm just going to roll that and down. Roll it from one hand to the other, and it should come away. Now, oh. you see, you see. It's not uh, as easy as it looks. Not enough weight. OK, <laughs> we'll make another one, but okay. more weight next time. D dig, dig in deep. The first paper mill in England was established around 1490. But at the time, paper was mainly imported from Europe, making it extremely costly. Firmly and with confidence. With confidence, sir and manufacturers could be recognised by their watermarks. Not too bad. There's quite a deep indentation here. When the paper's pressed, that will pretty much all come down to the same thickness, and you really shouldn't be able to see it on the surface, but when you hold it up to the light, the displaced fibres will, will show as a watermark. The paper is pressed for an hour. We'll uh, take the press off now and see what we've got. Quite excited by this. After 50 years, the novelty wears off. <laughs> That's the first of our bits of paper. That's brilliant. And you can see the watermark. Paper making Tudor style. <laughs> Thank you very much. The daily running of the monasteries required many lay workers, leaving the monks free for worship, prayer or study. Usually these workers were men, but certain jobs were open to older women. Considered by the monks to be beyond the temptations of the flesh, they helped with gardening, cooking and the washing of linens. Which is what Ruth has been commissioned to do. My main cleaning chemical throughout all my housework is wood ash. It's particularly good at dealing with grease, with dissolving it so that you can wash it away. But when you're doing the laundry, you don't necessarily want pure ash in your best napkins. So what I'm going to do is filter the chemical within the ash out into a nice clean liquid. Inside a bucket with a hole in the bottom, Ruth makes a filter of river gravel and straw and then the ash just goes on top. And this is, you know, just out of the fireplace. And then I just need to pour some water through. And let that seep through, leaching out every last bit of chemical into a really strong lye solution. The word lye, after all, is just a short form of alkali. With Tom and Ruth attending to monastic matters, Peter is keeping the farm running. 
The cows have eaten all the grass, and there is a shortage of food. To source a Tudor solution, Peter has come to meet Ted Green, who looks after the woodlands at Nepp Castle in West Sussex. Hi, Ted. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. How are you? Well, really, really pleased because I've just found this uh, tree, which is going to really work for a ladder for us. You're making a ladder out of this tree? Yeah. Oh, Christ. Well, then, there you go. <laughs> I'll bring the tools. You bring the tools. I'll bring the ladder. Straight in front of you. Ted is reviving an ancient farming practice which has existed ever since animals were domesticated. Harvesting hay from trees. It's a perfect solution for the dry months. As trees keep their leaves hydrated, so the hay will provide a good source of moisture. It's something which actually predates grass. It's only in modern times that people start thinking about grass. Animals never, never ate only grass. We made them eat grass. Which trees are we looking at cutting? In this particular case, we've got two trees which are ash, which they absolutely love. It's yeah. one of the top trees for animals. Right, I've been lugging this ladder around long oh, enough. Okay. Where Let's, do you want it? Well, we're going to try and rest it in that tree. Right. Just see how you go. Here we go. No no, 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 no. Over your way a bit. Oh. That's it, you're in. Great, I don't mind that. Go on, try it. I'm not overly convinced about this. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, right. Um. So you're up. Yeah, for now. OK. So what am I going for here, Ted? What am I looking for? This year's growth, which should have leaves right down the stem to near the trunk. That's brilliant. That one? And that's a, good, that's a good size as well. That's lovely for, for storing. These leaves, Ted, so they're, they're going to... Are they going to hold their nutrients? Yep, yep. That because we're cutting them this time of the year, obviously when they fall off in the autumn, the tree has put all the minerals and nutrients back into itself. But by doing this, we're trapping them all in the in the leaves. Unlike coppicing, where material is cut from the base of the tree, harvesting tree hay like this is known as pollarding. The leaves are cut and regrow above the height of the animal's head, which meant farmers could control the crop. It was one of the earliest forms of woodland management. Well, Pete, that looks like you got most of it off to me. Yeah, I think so. Wonderful. As well as laundering the linen for the upcoming abbot's feast, Ruth is also tackling some more personal garments. While most lay people had little time for bodily hygiene, for monks, washing was a matter of religious discipline, demanded before meals and the duties of the day. Having clean clothes was essential. According to the rule of St. Benedict, a monk was supposed to wear his woolen tunic next to his skin. Then he had his woolen scapula over it, a woolen gown and a woolen hood. But by 1500, lay people wouldn't have dreamed of wearing wool next to the skin. They all wore linen underwear, something that could be laundered regularly. And the monks wanted some of that comfort and cleanliness themselves. So there are records of monks buying underwear. And there are also records of them having it laundered. So I've put a load of um, sheets in. If I just keep piling up and up and up and up until the basket's full, it'll all compress down and I have real difficulty getting my lie to move between. So once I've got a layer, I make a shelf. The shelf will support the next layer of linen saving the bottom layer from being crushed. So now it's the moment for my extra strong lye. I pour this lye on, it's going to slowly filtrate its way through all the greasy, dirty things, dissolving any grease that's there. So on it goes. Tom is overseeing the production of a book 
which the abbot will present to his patron at the feast. In medieval England, hand-copied books were still a precious commodity, mainly the preserve of nobility and the monasteries. But by the reign of Henry VII, a new technology from the continent was changing this, the printing press with movable type. Developed by a German craftsman, Johannes Gutenberg, the press allowed individual letters to be set into text and rearranged with ease. Printing expert Nick Smith is setting the type for the abbot's book. So when you put these letters in, you're not actually putting them in as you would read them? No, the letter on the end of the piece of type is going to be upside down and backwards as far as the compositor is concerned. So he has to be able to read a line like that just to check that there are no errors in it. And that, of course, means that when it's turned over, inked and pressed into paper, it'll come out the right way around. Printers used to refer to these types of sorts. If you run out of the uh, stock of a particular character, you can say you're out of sorts. Once a page of type is set, it is carefully transferred to a metal frame called a chase and held in place with wedges known as furniture. If those letters move in a millimetre, it becomes a smudge. You lose it does, it. yes. You can't afford to have the type moving at all. Um, in fact, some of the inks we use are so sticky that if a type is at all loose, the sticky ink will actually pull it out of position. And That's that, a lot of work to put That back. can be a disaster. So these are the ink balls? These are the ink balls, yeah. Pick up ink from the ink block there. Now, a sheet of paper then goes on here. Now I'm turning the frisket down. This is a, a light metal frame covered in paper. And this is basically a mask. Only the areas that want to print are going to touch the paper. Provide the pressure by pulling on this bar. We now have to move the press bed in again. So it's a double and, uh, printing process. It's a double printing process, and the reason for that is simply that with this simple screw mechanism, it's not possible to develop enough pressure to print a whole sheet in one go. And so there's our printed sheet. Look at that. So how many of these sheets would you expect to print in an hour? They should print 250 in an hour. But I can't really imagine that they ever managed that for long <laughs> period. You could make it a little bit faster if you had a boy who was known as a prince's devil taking off the printed sheets, because that, that required no skill at all. Well, you've got an unskilled labourer here, and we've got a book <laughs> to print, so well. We'd better on. get on with the next sheet then. Yep. <laughs> This new printing technology was developed by entrepreneurs, not the church. As the century progressed, they made more and more affordable books, which ordinary people might own. It was an invention that would change the world. Once the lye has removed all the grease from the laundry, it's time to wash it. You can find common washing places like this all over Britain for hundreds of years. Every community had to have somewhere to do their laundry. The key to Tudor laundry was brute force. It's hard work with this, but that's the point. That is what does the job for you. There's no chemicals involved. It is purely mechanical action. What you're doing is forcing molecules of water under tension through the fibres, and it just physically, mechanically dislodges the dirt. It's the bashing that does it. Once thoroughly wrung out, the laundry is laid on the grass to dry. The combination of water and sunlight 
produces a bleaching effect. So the monastery sheets are about six shades whiter than ours. <sighs> the abbot's book is nearly finished. It just needs binding. Apprentice bookbinder Eve Goodman is showing Tom the process. One of the things with printed books is you've got to be really, really careful to make sure you don't get the pages out of order. You look at the originals and there are quite a few where a page is upside down, where an apprentice <laughs> has not been quite paying attention. Once all the papers are folded, they are sliced in half. It should be one continuous movement. Okay. Bring the knife towards you. And fold it again to form sheets. Making sure that all the pages are the right way up. God, it's nice stiff paper, this. Oh, it's high quality, I tell you. At this date, the way bookbinding was working was you had a bookbinding shop and people would come in with their pages, having had them printed, and hand them over and say, I want you to bind those. This is the, the point at which industrious bookbinding is happening, where suddenly people can afford to go and buy their pages and take them to a bookbinder. I suppose the ability to mass produce books of this type means that when the Reformation occurred, Henry VIII was able to print the Bible in English and get it out there, making that sort of break from Rome so much easier because obviously a lot of the Bibles were printed in Latin and you needed to have that separation. Exactly. A small press was used to hold the pages in place. While their spines were marked out and a series of slits cut. Right, this is the vital part. This is the part that holds all of the book together. This is sewing on the cord. So... A series of cords are lined up with the slits in the spine and the whole book is sewn together. So you are literally just stitching a book? Yeah, you're sewing it together. Have a look. It's actually it's very precise, isn't it? Yeah, it starts to feel like a book at this point. Doesn't yeah, it? a proper present. Next, the book needs to be cut to size. This is called a plough. You see there's a blade here. And you'll see, as soon as I got through this lot, just how silky smooth the edge of the book is. If you run your finger down there, it squeaks. That's unbelievably smooth. That's amazing. The spine is rounded using a hammer. And you can see that there's, that there's a curve on it. There's a right. bit of a curve. And all books have got that. And it's all about making sure that the spine is as stable as possible. This also forms a ledge for the book's cover to sit on. So you can see the rounding over of the spine is so that you get this seamless yeah. curve. Originally covered in plain vellum, by 1500, luxury books had fine leather covers. And the craftsmanship required to make a book emphasises really why they were such prestige gifts, doesn't it? And finally, the book is put in the press to set overnight. I think the abbot's going to be very proud to give that to his patron. Thank you for letting me observe. Oh, that's all right. Hey, Turkish. Hey, Georgie. Hey, Mildred. Back on the farm, the pigs are flourishing. Peter's tree hay is going down well. She absolutely loves it. I'm a convert to tree hay. It's fantastic. It's your food. Stop playing with your dinner. And with the crop finally dry, it's time to bring in the peas. Well, our pea scare has definitely worked. We still have a crop. I mean, I think there's a lot of peas on there. There's an awful lot of peas. Yeah. If we were trying to pick these by hand, we'd be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> the team are using scythes. First developed in Roman times, by the medieval era, they had spread throughout Europe. The smell's amazing, isn't it, Tom? It is. But it's turned out quite easy as well. loading the peas into our wagon. And these dried peas, we can thrash to get the peas out. But the stems, we can feed to our cows. <laughs> it 
Making friends down there, Peter. Making friends. For the Tudor farmer, a good crop would have been a godsend. Feeding them and their animals, and even making a little cash if there was extra to sell. The crop will be beaten with sticks to release the peas, a process known as thrashing. Oh, isn't it fantastic Please. standing in a farm so completely full of one of our crops? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Look at that. There are hundreds of peas. Yeah, this is good. Okay, well, I don't know if it's the weather or what, but this has been a really good crop. I think it's more down to our Tudor farming techniques, to be honest. <laughs> or maybe enough time spent on our knees in church. <laughs> the abbot's feast is just days away. But the elaborate food he will be serving was a far cry from the simple meals of ordinary monks. Benedictus benedicat, per Jesum Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen. Every meal began with grace. Talking was forbidden, so instead, the monks communicated over the dinner table using sign language. Each monk had a daily allowance of two and a half pounds of bread and a gallon of ale, and two pounds of fish, a fundamental part of the monastic diet. But fish wasn't only important for the monks. The church decreed that for three days a week and on many holy days, lay people should not eat meat, only fish. Oh. While the general public had to make do with dried or salted fish, the monasteries had become expert fish farmers. They engineered elaborate systems of ponds to grow salmon, pike and carp, which will be served at the abbot's feast. Ruth has come to the monastic kitchen to prepare the food, starting with the carp. This would have been a luxury food. It's freshwater fish. And for most people, you know, that was in itself a sign of wealth and of privilege. Only those who had the rights to the fishing could take the fish. So freshwater fish carried a certain social cachet. You knew if you were served any of the freshwater fish that you were being given the produce of the owner of the land. Ruth stuffs the fish with anchovies, bread, herbs and spices a valuable commodity in Tudor England. The monks obviously tried to keep a really close eye on what they were using and spending in their kitchens, just the same way as they were keeping a close eye on the way their lands were being farmed. So monks were supervising chefs. Uh, they were in charge of the stores, of keeping count of food going in and food coming out. Ruth makes a cage to support the fish during the roasting. The church was instrumental in the advancement of fine dining. The frequent travels of the clergy meant new ideas and cooking methods spread throughout Europe. Ruth is trying out an elaborate pastry dish. I'm building a pastry castle. According to a menu from 1500, the Bishop of London served just such a thing at a dinner. It started with a moat of custard, and then within it was a great pastry castle. And in each of the turrets of the pastry castle, there'll be a different filling. And I rather thought, well, you know, if it's good enough for the Bishop of London, maybe it's good enough for our abbot. Peter has turned his attention to drinks for the feast. In the 1500s, wine was an expensive commodity. Here we go, pop that back on there. One way to make it last longer was to distill it into a spirit. Distiller Jack Green has made a still, the apparatus needed to produce brandy. 
So as I blow air into the coals here, they heat up, that heats the wine, but what happens yeah. then? We need to slowly bring it up yeah. until we come to the boiling point of the alcohol, which is lower than the boiling point of water. The alcohol evaporates, goes up into the condensers on here, and run down this channel here, and then down the spout. Essentially, the, the alcohol evaporates at a lower temperature than the rest of the wine? Yes. Mm. Uh, little, last little sophistication is we put this wet blanket on it. Oh, like a little tea cosy, but yeah. the opposite. Yeah. So rather than keeping it hot... And that cools it down. Yes. Right. OK, so we're getting, we're getting a few drips coming out of here. Yes, the first alcohol that comes over is methanol. And methanol is the bad stuff. What happens if I drink that? <laughs> well, you probably go blind. Methanol has a lower boiling point than ethanol. So the first drops that come over are the methanol, and we discard those. When do you know that you've changed from methanol to ethanol? I just have to guess. Just have to guess. All right, OK. When the ethanol starts to come through, the spout is connected to a long tube which is cooled in a bucket of water. This will help the ethanol fully condense. We're getting some already. That's fantastic. Uh, so that, that is now the yeah, ethanol bit, coming through. A bit faster now. A bit faster. It's a very delicate business. Right. The reason it's called spirits is that uh, this is the body, yeah. and the spirit rises, uh, and this is the spirit. That's why you call the it spirits. spirit sort of thing. Yeah. So carry on, carry so, on. So the, the, the vapour of alcohol is the spirit leaving the body of yes, wine. Yes, yes. Okay. By the way, I'm looking forward to trying it. Oh, yes, you'll be the first. I'll put my thumb over the spout and uh, it smells good. How does it taste? Just a little sip. Don't drink it all. That's really nice. Oh, good. That is really good. nice. Good, good. The food is prepared and the brandy distilled, but there's one more job to do before the feast. Peter and Tom have been called upon to serve at the banquet, and they need a lesson in Tudor etiquette. You have no idea what an honour this is, you know. This would have been gentlemen's sons who'd been carefully trained from childhood in how to be gracious, how to bow beautifully, how to serve at table with exactly the right etiquette, they'd have special carving lessons, I mean, so that they could do it precisely and cleanly and quickly. Uh, you've gone up in the world. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This okay. is your serving towel, right? You put the serving towel on for serving dinner. It's a, a symbol of what sort of role you play at dinner because he's going to have slightly different to you. So you get two towels because you're carving. Again, badge of office. I mean, the posher your servants were, the posher you were. Mm. And the better turned out your servants were, the more it reflected on you. What are your bows like? Come on, let me see your bows. Bowing or genuflecting? Yeah, it is more like a genuflect, yeah. You want to be doing the... the particularly when you're serving the food, you want to be able to come down with the trays held in front of you. Yeah, that's the sort of thing. You're doing that in two moves, I think. Go and have another go. I thought it was pretty good the first time, you see. On Try not stepping quite so far, just keep it really small and then that knee can come right into your heel. It's better. Look, you're going to go in there, you're going to be elegant, you're going to be lovely. We're going to do you proud. You are. Yeah. Go on. Go and be gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> it's the day of the abbot's feast and the monastery's most important patron will be dining. More than just an expression of hospitality, it was a vital chance to win favour and donations. As a sign of humility, following the example of Christ, a senior monk would wash the feet of the guests before dinner. Benedict Domine nos et haec tua dona, quae de tua largitate sumus sumtore, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Amen. The seating plan was meticulous. Only the most distinguished guests would sit on the high table with the abbot. The further away you sat, the lower your social status. Each of the elaborate dishes, Ruth's pastry castle with a custard moat, 
sugar platters decorated with gold, and the carp, along with many other dishes, would be ceremonially presented to the abbot for approval before being served. Carving carp for the monastic table, it's not a case of filleting the fish. Instead, I'm running my knife around the outside of the fish, cutting off the fins and, and the tail and the head, and then the body, I'm gonna cut it into equal-sized portions, complete with bones, because when it's served, it will still look like a fish, but each piece can be picked up and eaten as bite-sized morsels. The drinks, served in cups, were kept on a board. The origin of the word cupboard. They would be offered to the top table, with the server waiting for the guest to finish before removing the cup. And Tom's prestigious gift is presented. As a token of our gratitude, I would like to present you with this book, A Life of St. Edmund in English. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any scraps of food were put in an alms bowl to be given to the poor. The monasteries were so dominant in the provision of welfare that it was only after the dissolution that the government was forced to confront the issue. With the dining over, the guests were entertained into the night by musicians. Revelry was not uncommon even within the monastic walls. This has been a real insight into how those above us actually live. It's really different, isn't it? I mean, when you think, our dining seems quite formal. <laughs> <laughs> we all put our best clobber on and we all sit there and behave ourselves, but this is a whole scale above. And also the sheer amount of food being consumed. It's yeah. crazy, isn't it? It is crazy. I mean, I know everything there gets eaten by somebody, but that initial mm -hmm. huge groaning board is quite a sight to see. I want to stress, I did not drop the custard castle. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to a couple of times. Despite how much wine you drank. <laughs> yeah, well. But this sort of event, it was what kept the monasteries funded. Yeah. Well, they're stuffed and so are their coffers. <laughs> Next time on Tudor Monastery Farm, it's harvest time. This has taken us four and a half hours. And look how much more there is. Produce a vital Tudor resource. Did you think of salt as a basic ingredient? Having to process it down just adds so much labor. <laughs> and enjoy some Tudor entertainment. I always knew that this scythe was meant for more than just harvesting peas. From here they shall not pass. Ha, 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 ha!